Hey guys, welcome back to Shredcraft RC. I'm Cam, and today we are checking out the latest offering from Yokomo here. This is the RD 2.0 Rookie Drift. The goal being here to see if this is the next competitor to the RDX here. So uh, I got my base chassis here from the RDX to compare it to the RD 2.0. And I don't know if you'll notice this, but this was interesting. The font on the RD, part of the RDX, is very similar to RD on Rookie Drift. So you kind of see some of the DNA since RevD, from what I'm told, was started from employees who used to work for Yokomo. Just a fun little thing. Don't know if that's exact fact, but it's what I was told. The goal for this series is to see if for a more friendly price for a beginner to get into buying their first RC drift kit is the RD 2.0 a good option. Nizo's Bad Shop had a great video where he actually drove it, showed all the improvements compared to the RD 1.0. Really made me want to get one and see how it did versus the RDX. So picked one up, got this one from Super G, not affiliated. They just had it in stock. So with this series, I want to go into it as if a beginner was picking up their first kit and keeping all the electronics and everything budget oriented. Keep it plastic, build it completely stock, drive it completely stock. I'm going to show you guys tips on building it and some of the little nuances. So along the process, I want you guys, the viewers, to help me pick a body. I will probably in the next video come up with some options, either what's down at my local track, Scale Science, because we gotta support your local hobby shop. We'll see what they have in stock and then I'll make a list and maybe do a poll and you guys can pick the body. I want you guys to pick the body color. And then also one of the episodes I thought it'd be cool to show you how I design a livery. So what we can do is actually have you guys give your input on color design and ideas for the livery and I will design them on a video with your input and maybe we'll do a live stream something like that and then getting it printed on actual wrap film and then wrapping your own livery I thought that'd be a cool episode so before I even crack open the box and I already opened this one because I measured the chassis to design a chassis and I fished the instructions out to get those little glance but the first thing I do is I like to start with a clean workspace and then I pull all the tools that I'll need for the process out and I'll just quickly go over those. Needle nose pliers, uh, good for grabbing nuts. Calipers, you'll need a set of calipers to measure your turnbuckles. A little razor knife, this is just a little hobby knife. This is just to cut off plastic burrs. I just use the kit wrench uh, rather than pulling out my big ones. Shock pliers, these are cheap but they get the job done. Mip drivers, I got a 1.5 and then a two, probably gonna use the two most of the time. And then turnbuckle wrench, this is just a cheap one that comes in a kit. There's probably one in the box that I'll end up using. And then a little tray to empty the little bags into just so things don't fly all over the desk. I like to keep them organized. We'll go ahead and crack the box open and I'll show you what's in there. So initially when you crack open one of these boxes, you may be overwhelmed and just not know what to do with all these little bags. One thing I recommend is just kind of leaving everything in there and finding bag number one, two, and three and maybe pulling those out to be ready because those will be your first steps. So each of these are numbered. There's four. Looks like transmission. Pull that one out because we know that's an early step. I kind of glanced over the instructions. And looks like there's bags three, five, can't see what else, so that's probably an early bag. You can see the tools and stuff are in here. Um, so I'll pull that one out. And one, we'll need that. And then the chassis plate, which I've already taken out so I can measure the holes and get that digitized. So I will set the box out of the way and then we will open up the manual and see what we have to do next. And then yeah, next step, we'll go ahead, put the tow blocks on, and then build the uh, tie rods, it looks like, with some turnbuckles. So when I get there, I will show you how I measure those compared to the manual, because you can set them here, and it's the same length. So I'll probably just do a time lapse when I'm building, and then explain the parts that I think are 
important to keep in mind when you're building your first time kit. So one little thing I wanted to point out, when building uh, the turnbuckles here, sorry, the exposure is going to be weird because this is black, this is white, but they have specific measurements. So what I like to do is make sure I take a pair of calipers, measure exactly between the turnbuckles, and just make sure that they are the same. So a little tip there, uh, I know we'll probably do our own alignment on it, but this will just keep everything square and even as we build. So I'll make sure I do that on the rear camber links as well. And then uh, we'll move on to the next, next step here, which looks like the bell crank system. Here I got the bell crank system all set up. It's a new wiper design here. So similar to the RDX where your Ackerman is going to be adjusted by the ball stud here on the bell crank. So when assembling this, this connection here is plastic to plastic, but there is a spacing pin. You just want to make sure you don't over crank that because you want this to move nice and freely. As you can see, there's there's no play in any of that, but it lets it move nice and freely. Same thing with the bearings. They'll just, this is what's controlling the steering, so you don't want any binding and you want this wiper system to be as free as possible. So now that that's assembled, we're gonna move on to the differential. So it's still pretty thick, but I think we're gonna run it because we're gonna build this totally stock. and. When I do this, I like to fill a little bit in all the open areas, kind of push it down in there, up until where the spiders are kind of about halfway covered. And I don't know why the camera is having a hard time focusing here. But uh, then I'll kind of hold the top pin down and rotate it a little bit, and then I'll work the grease or the silicone oil down into the cracks. And then I will add more and do that process again until it's about 75 to 80% filled up. So, see if we can focus, probably not. But, uh, yeah. I'd say that's about 70%. There's still some air bubbles, but those are gonna come out. Get the oil out of the way here. My diff screws, and these are nice. On the MIP drivers, they sit right on them. And then the diff cap, is keyed the first one. I'm not tightening that all the way down. I'm just sinking it before I lock them down because I don't want this calf, cap to go on unevenly. So once I get them all sunk, I'll work them in a star pattern or a cross pattern because there's only four. Now I'm gonna start feeling where the screw gets a little more tension. I don't want to crank these down because I don't want that gasket to get warped and then leak fluid. Here we have a diff. So I'll move on to the gearbox. see I got the transmission assembled and on the deck. Definitely important to make sure this spins freely uh, and smooth. It may be a little tight when it's brand new, but it'll loosen up. Make sure the diff spins freely. But there's that all together in the front end. And so now we'll move on to the bulkheads and the arms and show you what it looks like when we're moving on to those.
Alright, so I got the front bulkhead and arms together and something I just like to double check and point out because I've seen like the race guys do it, but uh, a loose car is a fast car. Now we're not necessarily looking for speed, but we want all these arms to be moving as freely as possible because this is what is attached to your steering and your front suspension. So this RD 2.0 feels really nice. Everything is pretty tight. I do like the option of having adjustable arms, both uh, upper and lowers. So you can adjust camber without having to take the entire arm off and put a shim in there or something. I do notice that these have curved ball ends now. So next up we'll be going to assemble the hubs here and then we'll get the front end kind of all dialed in and you want to just make sure again everything's moving nice and freely and the, nothing's binding everything's equal length on both sides so when you go to set it up you have a better starting point with everything being equal so i'm going to go ahead i'll get these hubs assembled get the front end dialed in <laughs> start assembling the rear arms here and just a little pro tip they have provided black grease here and I'm gonna basically just fill the CDV joint with the smear of black grease not too much but just enough to keep that area lubricated because it's gonna see the highest rpm out of any moving part here on the chassis I will take a toothpick and just kind of work it into all the crevices here paper towel here just kind of wipe the excess away. So now we have a lubricated CDV. So I'm gonna get to work on these rear arms. Again, just make sure everything's nice and smooth and free moving and show you what it looks like before we put shocks on. chassis is pretty much complete. I just wanted to show you guys before I move on to shocks, but here are the arms. Everything's moving freely. There may be a little stick there and that's probably just the fact that it's brand new plastic. The rear here, nice and free moving. Everything feels nice and smooth. There's not a lot of slack. The rear has a little bit. Maybe you could shim it out with some 0.1 mil shims, but really I felt worse on other chassis. The front feels very solid, not a lot of play. Start getting the shock stuff out and set up and then show you uh, any tips and tricks I might do. I just finished up the shocks here or finished bleeding them. One thing I wanted to share that kind of helps me out after you bleed them you always have a little bit of silicone here on the ends so I take a little isopropyl alcohol spray it on there and then wipe all that silicone oil away. That just kind of lets me see if they're leaking because alcohol will kind of dry the wet areas so then after I build them I can check and see if there's any more shiny spots but that kind of mats out the shock so that's just something i'll do before i even put the spring collars on just because i don't want those to spread oil or hold oil in the threads and then it looks like your shock's leaking or it's wet at the bottom and you're like why is that usually it's because sometimes you'll pinch a diaphragm when you're putting these on or an o-ring at the bottom's leaking so the bottom of the shock here will get uh wet but by doing this before you even Put the spring on or then even on the car. There's all the dust and debris from the ground when you're running. Your car's not going to stick to the shock body. Make them all dirty right away. So uh, that's another thing from that I've picked up from racer guys. But a clean car is also a fast car. So not only a loose car, but a clean car. So 
You don't want dirt and debris all up in your hinge pans or filling up your ball joints or anything like that. So if you're going to run your car outside, which definitely my plan with this one, make sure you start clean and then clean it after you run it. And that will just ensure that it uh, will keep operating as it did right when you built it. So a couple beginner tips. Some nice clean shocks there. So we'll throw the springs on. Since all these look to be the same, I'm not going to separate them. Normally I would do the fronts in a pair and the rears in a pair if I'm running different springs. And then get this collar on. Looks like they just need a little persuading. And then backing them off to make sure you're not going to cross thread them up that collar. But uh... So there's two different height collars for the bottom. The short one will give more compression in the spring. The higher one will give less compression in the spring. The shorter ones are going in the rear, the longer, taller ones are going in the front. But both these taller ones on the front, we'll separate those. Front set, you want to make sure you push them all the way down onto the ball cup. And then I'm just going to back these off to like one or two threads. I think the book says three, three mil of preload, so once we get electronics mounted, we can adjust those for the weight of the car. All right, so my rears, we got the rear of the car here, and you're gonna have to forgive me for struggling with this. Uh, fresh ball cups always sometimes a pain to get on. So I found a good point, and push that on, and front suspension. There is the RD Rookie Drift 2.0, base chassis. All right, now that our chassis is all assembled, Kind of wanted to talk about budget friendly electronics when you're just starting out because it can be kind of daunting and you can you will end up spending a lot of money on the electronics but the good thing is the electronics can go between chassis so what i did here was i pulled out some options for my first yd2s drift built electronics that I would kind of think if someone were searching on Amazon or going to their local hobby store something kind of in a better price range so the first one is this AGF RC Servo. This is the B44 BLS, and they do have an updated version of this, I just checked. But I believe this is a $50 servo, maybe $48. But this is programmable on your PC with this USB dongle. Basically, that's nice for drifting because you can change the damper, uh, the speed, the power, center point all that stuff. So this is kind of where a piece that I've used and a servo that I can recommend and I'm going to put it in this chassis to use along with AGFRC's gyro. So they have a gyro they pair with this, something you can find on Amazon. It's a $40 gyro. So compared to the Yokomo V4 which is almost an $80 gyro, this is a lot more budget friendly. So there we have the servo and gyro. I don't have the gyro yet ordered and then moving on to remote and receiver I'm gonna use my fly sky noble it's kind of like a good starting point for remote and it, it does everything you would ever need it to do for drifting so this is their little receiver and I like that how small these are and I like the remote it it's a nice remote and then moving on to ESC this is something that probably most people will find in their searches but this is a hobby wing 10 BL 120 they make one as well that's the 10BL60. This 120 is like a $48 ESC. They now uh, make a V2 of this as well. Basically, I think it just has some programming differences, but you can do your timing, so your turbo and your boost on this, and I'll show you how to do that. But I've had this forever, it runs great. This was my first drift ESC, so it's gonna go in this car. And then this is something I'm still unsure about, but this is a Amazon motor that I got and maybe only ran it once or twice. But it says that this is a 4.5 turn. It also on the website says it's a 13.5 turn. So 13.5 would be good for drifting, 4.5 not good for drifting. I'm gonna put this in and just see if that's gonna be a viable option. If not, we're gonna look at some other budget-friendly drift motors and possibly ESCs. But I do think that this is a viable option if you're just starting, if you're just a garage bashing or playing with your drift car outside. So I will go ahead. Oh, another thing I want to mention. Get 
yourself some good double-sided sticky tape because you're going to go through it more than you think. Moving electronics around, changing things, maybe you update your receiver, maybe you update your ESC, but positioning of electronics and stuff changes for me at least. I like this gel double-sided tape. It seems to be really strong and durable. It's worked great for all my cars. I'm going to get to mounting some electronics, getting that stuff sorted, and I don't have the gyro here yet so I don't know if we'll fire it up, but uh, maybe throw some wheels on it and see how it sits. All right, here it is. The RD 2.0 budget build version one. So you got the servo, put the big battery, thinking that if this is a new guy, maybe they have batteries from their crawler. So that's on there. This motor again, and we're gonna try the Hobby Wing 10BL120. This is one of my new bumpers. I don't know if you'll be able to see that. But a new bumper design, I figured it was only right to put my bumpers. I will be making more of these soon in the future. It's meant to be able to put your fingers in there and pick the car up easier off the track. Same thing with the rear and then having the profile making it easier to ride the wall. So that was a prototype. It's a little short I think extending that back. The front I enjoy. I think that's the right length. The shocks feel good. The overall build was simple straightforward just like any other yokomo build that i've done the angle seems pretty good i did give it a quick just bench alignment didn't measure the toe but i measured the turnbuckles to give it what looks like maybe just slightly towed out but yeah the ackerman and the steering all looks good again haven't checked caster checked both camber just to make sure they were the same before i set toe the rear i checked uh, and then i set each wheel to like negative three degrees to start. There is a little progression um, when it leans, so we'll try that first. Gonna run it a stock. So once that gyro gets in, we'll be able to go run it and uh, see how it does. And then the episodes following, I'll make a list of bodies available kind of in a budget friendly price range and then have you guys vote on a body and color in the livery or no livery. I will test these electronics and if they're not viable then we'll look into other budget friendly drift electronics. I do know the servo is good and the gyro will be good. So right there is under $100 for a servo and a gyro, which if you step up to the higher end stuff, you're gonna be spending $100 or more on a servo alone. Maybe starting in the $70 range, but going up, you know, in another, in the gyro is gonna be anywhere from 70 to, to $110, $120, even more if you get the Futaba stuff. Motors, typical drift motors, usually in the range of $100 to $150, and then drift specific ESCs. Drift specific usually you're starting in $150 to $200 range and then going all the way up to $300. So the electronics can add up and they can get expensive. Fly Sky Noble, very good. Remote with a very small receiver. I like that. It works. And then people either run a Shorty 2S LiPo or this is a full size, basically a crawler battery or standard size battery. So. It fits, the tray is adjustable on the bottom so these can slide out and accommodate a bigger battery. I thought that was pretty cool. Other points that I found, nothing really too strange or out of the ordinary. It was pleasant, all the plastic was easy to work with, the ball cups were easy to work with. Yeah, I didn't really have any moments to write home about. So I'll look into some bodies and get a list going here and then have you guys pick. Let me know if you guys picked up uh, Rookie Drift 2.0 yet. Uh, let me know if you're a Yokomo fan or not, but I am, so I'm interested to see how this will do compared to the Rev D RDX, but it's cool to have another option for the rear wheel drive RC drift cars out here. Just want to say thanks for watching. Make sure you stay tuned for the next episode because we will dive in a little deeper into tuning this thing, designing a chassis, designing a livery, painting a body, basically everything that you would want to do when you're just starting getting into the hobby. And I know everyone's first search is hop-ups, but I don't think that's the most important thing to get started. I think the electronics are probably the most important to have a good driving experience. And then after that, uh, we could dive into some aluminum parts and stuff like that. But uh, let me know what you think about that. And I will catch you guys on the next one. Make sure you uh, subscribe so you get updates on when my videos come out. And then 
hit that thumbs up button because that does a whole bunch of help for the channel and I appreciate it so thumbs up if you like it if you don't I don't, you know thumbs down it so uh, rookie drift 2.0 coming at you this year thanks for watching see ya